thanks, Dina, for the invitation. So <coughs> I'm going to try to show you guys some connections between juggling and some different areas of math. And uh, if you're only interested in the math, maybe I'll get you interested in some juggling. And if you're only here for the juggling, then maybe you'll find some of the math interesting. So um, first, to kind of um, use, use math for our tool to kind of analyze juggling, we're going to have to have some basic rules to follow. And so here, here are some of the rules that we're going to follow, right? A juggler doesn't have to follow these, but if we're going to, I mean, use math in some way, we have to have some rules, okay? So first thing that we're going to assume is that you're always going to be juggling at some constant beat. You're never going to make like the left hand or the right hand go so super fast comparative. Okay, so you're always going to go constant beat, and you're always going to use your left hand and right hand. Okay, and it's just alternating between left and right hand throws. One other thing that we're going to assume is you're going to be juggling some pattern, and at some point it's just going to continue to repeat. So it's going to be uh, periodic. All right? And then the third rule is that when you do these throws, at most one ball is going to be caught and thrown on every single beat. Okay? And if one is caught, then you're going to have to throw that same ball. So this third rule, <clears throat> this try, this kind of avoids collisions, right? So if you if you were to throw the balls and two of them came down on one hand, then you have two balls in one hand, and you normally don't want that to happen. If you're a juggler, it's not really the end of the world. There are other types of juggling out there. You're you're like you could catch two balls and you could throw multiple balls, and that's called multiplex juggling. But we're trying to make this as simple as possible at the beginning, okay? So we're, we're going to have that rule as well. And you'll, you'll kind of see what's happening as I show you some more examples. OK. Um, <clears throat> OK, so what is a juggling sequence? This is also called a sight swap, if anybody's a juggler here. And it's just sort of a way of encoding uh, your, a pattern into a sequence of numbers. So first, what you're going to do is you're going to index the beats. right? So you just start the beats somewhere. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And then here's, here's what the numbers in the sequence mean. So if you throw a ball to a height of h, then what that means, it's going, it, it, if, if you have a throw that lasts h beats, then you're gonna, it's going to be a throw of height h. Okay? I'll show you some pictures and whatnot and demonstrate, and you'll see what this means. But, so just as a basic example, let's say you're throwing threes. Okay, just constantly throwing threes. So what you're doing is every throw, that throw is going to last three beats, and then the left hand is just doing the same thing. So you're just throwing three. So here, here's an example of, of three, 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 three. Okay? Okay. Um, and this sequence, well, this is infinite, right? But it's periodic. That was one of the rules. So instead of just writing it as this infinite sequence, we can kind of collapse it to this finite sequence because it's periodic, right? So I could just simplify that, that infinite sequence and just say that it's, it's just threes, okay? But there's nothing wrong with writing more threes there. It's just that's the simplified version of the sequence. Okay, and then if you threw fives and ones, then you're throwing a height of a five and then a height of one. We'll look at, well, what, what would this look like? I don't want to spoil it just yet because I want to kind of analyze these sequences and then I'll show you what they look like. Okay, but if you, if you have five, one, five, one, five, one, we'll just collapse that and just write Five one, and same thing. If you had five three one, five three one, we just write five three one, or seven one seven one seven one. That would just collapse to seven one, and so on. So does that kind of make sense? If you have this infinite sequence, you just look for the periodic part, and you could just simplify it. Okay. Again, there's nothing wrong with making those longer. It's just that that's kind of the essential part of the sequence. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so another way that you can sort of use some kind of mathematics to encode a juggling pattern. Well, one way is the sequence. Another way is you can make what's called a juggling diagram. And so the way that this works is you, here are the beats that you're going to do these throws. And the colors, well, that just, like the white dots will just be one of your hands. So you could say that this is your right hand, right? So the white dots will be throws from the, the right hand, and the, the black dots will be throws from the left hand, right? And so you're alternating between right and left throws. Okay? So let's look at what this sequence would look like as a diagram. So how do you do this? Well, 
What you do is you start at zero here, and we're going to throw. We're going to throw a three. Okay. So if I throw this three, well, by definition, it's going to come back three beats later. So you're going to throw it from your right hand, and three beats later, it's going to return. And uh, the nice thing about the diagram is it actually shows you which hand the ball is supposed to go into. But you can't really see that from the sequence necessarily, right? Okay. So three. Uh, a, a throw of three, you're going to throw from right to left, and then next you're going to have to do a throw from your left hand, which will come back three beats later to your right hand, and then, then your right hand to your left hand, and then so on. So this, you could kind of just assume that this goes on forever, and you could also assume that it started, you know, it's been going on for eternity or something. So this is called a juggling diagram. So we have a sequence, and we have a diagram, and now you can kind of ask some some questions, right? Like one thing we can notice here is that if you do this throw of three, well, you're, you have to do throws that alternate from right to left hands, okay? So let's look at what happens if you do four throws, okay? So if I throw uh, a ball at height four, okay, well then it's gonna return four beats later. So one, two, three, four. And if you look at this, you're gonna have to have the ball return to the same hand. Okay, so according, according to our rules, that's the way it is, okay? So, so, and again, if you throw a four from your left, it's gonna have to return to your left, right to right, left to left. So what this kind of is telling you is if you're throwing height four, then you're gonna have to, those throws are isolated to, to each hand, okay? I'll show you what all this looks like, okay? I'm just trying to, use the math to analyze it, and then see that, oh yes, it actually works with the juggling, right? <laughs> okay, so what did we get? Well, we get kind of this nice observation that'll help us along the way. So if you're gonna throw an odd height, you know, like uh, one, three, five, so on, <laughs> then all those passes are gonna go to your opposite hand, right? If you're writing out that sequence. And if you're throwing an even height, well, then that means the ball that you throw has to actually return to the same hand at some point, okay? So here is sort of how you can translate these throws now, right? So a zero throw, well, that would just mean that it's missing or you have an empty hand. So all of you right now are juggling the sequence zero, 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 right? <laughs> Not doing it. A one throw, this is an odd throw, right? So one has to pass from one hand to the other. So this would be a one throw. It's just kind of a, a quick pass between the two hands. A two throw, well, usually a two throw just means that you're actually holding it because uh, a throw of height two would be really, really, really low. Okay, so normally you don't even do anything. You just kind of like hold there. Uh, three, you're gonna have to pass, but a little bit higher. And then a four has to come back to the same hand. So if you threw this, it would just be like that. And then five will have to go to the other hand. It just keeps getting higher and higher. But if you're odd, you're gonna pass between the hands, right? So this is five, this is seven and then nine and so on. And then evens, they'll, they'll stay in the same hand, right? So four and then six and so on. Okay. Um, all right, so here, let's analyze this sequence now. So let's ask some questions. So if I have this sequence, five, one, and I'm just telling you it is a juggling sequence, you don't actually know that yet, right? I'm just telling you it is, right? <laughs> so if I give you five, one, um, let's draw out the diagram, right? So the diagram would look like this. And what are some properties of this thing? OK, so uh, five is the five. If, I, if I'm starting the sequence with my right hand, then the five is going to be a pass from the right to the left hand, right? If it comes back five beats later, it's an odd number. So five is going to go from the right to the left hand. OK, so here's the five. Okay? And then the one, if you look at the diagram, it's going to go from left to right. And notice that it's always happening, right? So that one, the little jump, is always going from left to right, and the right hand is always throwing the fives, okay? So what that actually looks like, looks like this. Okay, so the, this hand is always throwing the fives, this hand is always throwing the ones, right? And, um, yeah. <laughs> um, Okay, so here's one question. I kind of spoiled the question because I'm showing you, but the question might be, well, how many balls do I need to actually juggle that sequence, right? You know the answer is gonna be three because I just did it, but uh, what's one way that you could detect this? Um, one way that you could detect this 
from the juggling diagram is you can trace out each of the, the arcs. You're sort of following what one ball is doing. So you see, if I kind of trace out this arc in red, that's just kind of following one of the balls. So one of those balls is doing a five, and then it's doing a one, and then it's doing a five, and then it's doing a one. But in between, there's, there's two other balls, right? So you're actually doing this. But if you just follow one of them, uh, it traces out this arc in the diagram. And same thing with the other ones. So if you sort of color code this, you're, you're, uh, you're getting sort of these distinct paths, right? So if you kind of count the number of distinct colors used, then that would give you the number of balls, right? Now that's a lot more complicated than if I just give you that <coughs> sequence, right? If I, is there a way to detect the number of balls just from the sequence? That'd be a lot nicer, right? Then I wouldn't have to draw out this complicated thing, right? So that's one question that I'm, that I'm kind of asking you now to think about a little bit. I mean, five and one, somehow that's going to give us three balls, all right? So let's look at some other examples, okay? And, uh, <coughs> okay, well, <laughs> So here's sort of uh, what we showed from the juggling diagram. So the number of balls in, in a uh, juggling, seek, uh, juggling diagram would be the number of orbits. So that's the number of like colors traced out in that, in that diagram. Okay, so here's my question to you. So can we detect the number of balls directly from the juggling sequence? So what I'm doing here is I'm gonna give you sequences that are juggling sequences, okay? And here are the number of balls. Right, so I'm just trying to get you guys to think about, well, do you notice any pattern there? All right, so while you're doing that, I'll show you what these look like. So three, three looks like this, right? Just three, 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 three. The five, one, we just saw that one. Five, five, one, five, one, five, one, five, one, one. And then five, three, one. So that one, you're gonna have to throw a five, which will change hands, and then you're gonna have to throw a three, and you're gonna have to quickly pass that one over. So this is five, three, one, 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 five, three, one. 5, 3, 1, and so on. Okay, so all three of those have to use three balls. So maybe you're looking at these sequences, maybe you notice a pattern, maybe is there a way to quickly calculate that I'm getting three for all, all those sequences. Okay, let's look at some four ball sequences. So four ball sequences, you have four, 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 and what did we say before? Well, if you're only throwing fours, then the balls have to return to the same hand, right? So this is, this is a four ball uh, just four, 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 right? Everything is isolated to, the, to each hand. Well, not all four ball patterns are going to be like that. They're not all going to be isolated <coughs> to one hand. So for example, seven one is a four ball pattern. And it's going to be a lot like that five one. So to do the seven one, I'm just going to have to throw that right hand a lot higher, but I'm going to quickly pass the left to the right hand. So that looks like this. So it's, again, it's just like that five one. It's just a little bit higher and faster, right? And then uh, five three, five three, so I'm gonna have to throw five and with the right hand and then the three is gonna pass back from the left. So that looks like this. Um, okay, and then seven five three one is a lot like that five three one, but now you have a fourth one. So these lights are, Kind of interesting. Okay, so seven five three one seven five three one seven five three one. Oh my god! <laughs> um, the the bottom of this got cut off a little bit. Hang on, let me see if I can scroll this. Okay, so here's some five ball patterns. Oh. So five, the basic five ball pattern is just to do five 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 five. It's no problem. It's it's like only that slide, and if it happens again, I'll just. Oh, maybe it's just like on scroll mode. It's it's fine. <laughs> okay, so five, 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 five. Um, so again, fives are odd, right? So you're kind of passing from right to left, left to right. But it's actually just like the three, 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 three. It's just going to be a little bit higher and a little bit faster. So the five ball pattern is just like the three ball pattern. So three ball pattern looks like this. Five is just a little bit higher and faster. And the 9 one, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do that one, but it's like that 7 one and the 5 one. So that one is going to be much higher and much faster. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do that. Oh. <laughs> 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 OK, so 
Okay. Does anyone notice the pattern? Do you guys? Yeah. Anyone see? Yeah. What is it? Multiple balls. Uh, some. Some, well, some of them are. But do you guys notice there's like multiple a quick balls of whatever how many balls you have? Okay. Close. You actually don't even need multiples here. You just take these numbers. Yeah. Sum them up. You're taking the average, right? If you just take the average of those numbers. Yeah. Right. So five one. 5 plus 1 is 6, divide by the number in the sequence, or 2, you'll get 3. So it's really quick calculation, right? And that turns out to be true. So <laughs> you could prove that. Um, let me see here. OK, so it turns out that that's true. So the number of balls necessary to juggle a juggling sequence is the average. But the problem with that is you have to already know that that is a juggling sequence, right? This is not an if and only if. But it, it still can be useful because you can rule out, you know, if you're a juggler, you're trying to figure out, well, what things can I juggle, right? You don't really care that much about the math, but you're trying to figure out, like, what could I juggle? But as a mathematician, you're like, okay, well, what things are juggleable? So it's kind of interesting on both sides, right? So if you kind of look at the consequence of this, if you took the average of some finite sequence that you make up and you didn't get an integer, so for example, if I just looked at this possible juggling sequence, like 4, 3, so if I did 4, 3, 4, 3, 4, 3, um, what's the average of that? Well, 4 plus 3 is 7, divided by 2, you get 7 over 2, right? That's not an integer, so there's no way that that could possibly be a juggling sequence, right? Because the theorem says, if it is a juggling sequence, then the average will give you the number of balls, right? But if your average isn't an integer, there's no way that that could possibly be a juggling sequence. So here's kind of a useful consequence. You can rule out some juggling sequences from that. Okay, but now here's, an, here's, a, here's something you could ask. Well, what is the converse of, like, is the converse of this statement true? <coughs> the converse would be, um, let's say you make up a sequence and you get an integer for the average is that thing actually a juggling sequence, right? So that would be the question. So if the average actually is an integer, then is it a juggling sequence, okay? Well, it turns out that that's, that's not gonna happen because I, you could just kind of build an example. Like, do you guys see that the five and followed by a four is gonna be a problem because if you have a five and then a four in your sequence, those two balls are gonna return at the same time. And remember, we had a rule that said uh, you're not allowed to have collisions. Right? Okay, so, and then what's the average of this? Well, 3, 5, 4, is that 12 over 3? So if, if that was a sequence, it would be a, a four ball sequence, but it's not, right? Because you have this, this collision here, okay? All right, so the converse is not true, but is there a way to fix it, right? And it turns out that this, this is really neat, actually, that if you found one, like 3, 5, 4, the average is an integer, that one is not actually a juggling sequence, but it turns out that uh, there is a way that you could scramble those three numbers and you will get a juggling sequence actually. So this down here is uh, three, four, five. So three, four, five, three, four, five, three, four, five. That actually is a juggling sequence, okay? And so how do you detect that, right? That would, be, that would be the nice question. Like, if you're a juggler and someone says, I juggled this, you could quickly determine whether or not they were even lying, right? Because you could tell if it's actually something you could do. And uh, there's a way to detect it, actually. Okay, and here's, here's what the theorem looks like. Okay. <clears throat> so it looks a little bit complicated, but I'll explain it with the examples. But here's, here's how it is. So if you, if you give someone a, a sequence, you know, a finite sequence, so a0 up to an minus 1, then it's a juggling sequence if and only if the following thing happens. So what you're going to do is you're going to make a, a new sequence, the b0 up to bn minus 1. And all you do is you're adding the index. So what beat did you actually do that thing at? And then you have to mod it by n. Right? So if you divide uh, the, remain, the remainder is your, your mod. Or you could keep subtracting until you get to a number between 0 and n minus 1, if you haven't seen that before. Uh, it, so if that resulting thing, that resulting sequence is a uh, permutation, which is just a scrambling of the numbers between 0 and n minus 1, then it actually is a juggling sequence. Okay, so if that doesn't make any sense, that's okay. <laughs> I'll just show you with this example. So the 3, 5, 4 we said was not a juggling sequence, right? All right, so I'm going to add its position. So this first one I'm going to add 0, and then I'm going to add 1, and then I'm going to add 2, right? So those are the, the index, okay? 
Then you take these numbers and you mod it by, in this case, the, the n is the length of the sequence, so that's by 3. Okay? So 3 is a multiple of 3, right? So if I mod by 3, the remainder is 0. Uh, remainder is 0 if I divide by 3, remainder is 0. Right? So I get 0, 0, 0. But what I want is I want to actually have 0, 1, and 2 in, in that. I want it to be like a scrambling okay? of 0, 1, and 2. And it's not. So that is not a juggling sequence. But this one over here that I claimed was the 3, 4, 5, well, if I add 0, and then I add 1, and then I add 2, then I get 3, 5, 7. And if I mod by 3, I'll get 0, 2, and 1. And this, I hope we all agree, the numbers 0, 1, and 2 appear there in some, some scrambling, right? Okay, But you have to have all of them. It has to be a, a permutation, so it's like a bijection. You're just taking the numbers 0, 1, and 2, and you're just mixing them around. Okay. So what's neat about this is it's really a full detection, right? You can quickly tell whether or not something is or is not a, a juggling sequence. Before, you kind of only knew, well, if the average is an integer, it might be a juggling sequence, but it might not be, right? So, but here, this is kind of like the full picture. Um, okay, so now that we know how to detect them, you know, as a math person, you might ask, okay, well, can you count these? Like, how many of them are there? And as a juggler, you might be interested in that too, because maybe you want to learn all the three ball patterns, right? So, so how many patterns are there? Okay. Now, if you ask that question, you you have to <laughs> you have to refine it a little bit, because if I just ask how many patterns, well, there should be infinitely infinitely many, right? But if you kind of restrict yourself, maybe you want to only learn three ball patterns or patterns where they repeat after after three throws. Right, so the period is three. Or maybe you can only throw the ball to a height of nine or something like that. So you might want to restrict it that way. Okay? And it turns out that this answer, it's actually quite, the, the result is fairly simple, but it's really hard to prove this, actually. Okay, so the number of juggling sequences of period P, so again, that's like the length of the sequence, and at most B balls is this. It's just number of balls plus one raised to the, uh, the length. Period. So it's, it's a really simple formula, but to prove that it's it's quite complicated. Actually, <laughs> if you look this, look the look these guys up and look this paper up, it's quite it's quite complicated. So if you wanted to figure out exactly how many for b balls, then you would do this for uh, you would do b plus one to the p, and then you'd subtract off b to the p. Because remember, the original the original calculation says at most b balls. So you'd want to subtract out b minus 1 and, and less than that. So this, would, this formula would give you for exactly b balls. So here's what it would look like for three balls. Okay? So b is 3 here, and period 3. So the length is 3. So both b and p are 3, and the formula is quite quick. Right? You just do 4 to the 3 minus 3 to the 3. So there's 37 sequences that you can make. Okay? And here they are. Notice what's actually kind of interesting is, if you think about it, if you restrict the period of the juggling sequence, that's actually going to restrict the height. So if you look here, the maximum height throw is, are these nines here. Okay? Now, um, if you stare at this a little bit, look at this. So 9, 0, 0, and this next sequence, the 0, 9, 0. So are those the same thing? Like, what is, what is happening there? So if you throw a 9, you're just throwing this thing really high and then doing nothing, nothing, right? Or if you do 0, 9, 0, you're just doing nothing, then you throw the 9, and then you do nothing. But then it's going to start all over again, right? So 9, 0, 0 would be 9, 0, 0, 9, 0, 0, 9, 0, 0. But uh, this next one is the same thing, right? You guys see that? If you just take a sequence and you like push it so that the end becomes the beginning, you're not getting really a new pattern, right? So there's definitely some repeats here. You guys notice that? Yeah. So you might ask, okay, well, is there a way to, what are the distinct patterns there? So you could, you could go through them and try to figure them all out, okay? And just kind of highlight which ones actually are distinct from one another, right? So the 630, that's definitely different from the 603, right? It's just not exactly the same. But uh, that 063 is actually the same as that 630, right? Because the beginning becomes, the end becomes the beginning, right? You just kind of push it over. Those are called cyclic shifts. If I just take a sequence and I like push it 
and then the end becomes the beginning again. So next question would be, okay, well, we know that there's 37, but which, how many distinct ones are there? And you actually can calculate that, um, but it's, uh, it's way more complicated. <laughs> here's, the, here's the formula. You have to use something called the Mobius function, and to prove this, you have to use quite a bit of number theory. But uh, there is a formula, okay? It's not nearly as nice as the previous one, but, um, but it is fairly nice. Okay, so in this case, there ended up being 13. Okay, um, so now, now that we kind of have a, a way to encode these juggling sequences, um, or juggling patterns into these sequences, well, let's look at, well, how good is this? <clears throat> As a juggler, um, you're gonna see really quickly, it's not really the best method to describe what you're doing when you're juggling, because it turns out that a juggling sequence can be performed in many different ways. Right? So what, I, what I'm saying there is, so here's 3, 3, 3, three right? I can do this many different ways. If I throw one of the balls over, but at the same height, that's the same thing as 3, 3, 3, 3, 3. So you guys see that there's this one ball that's just going over, back and forth. This is called tennis, but this pattern is still 3, 3, 3, 3, 3. So right away, that just shows you that this thing isn't perfect for encoding juggling, juggling patterns. Right? It's just kind of a useful way to describe the throw heights. Okay? Half shower, that looks like this. This is 3, 3, 3, 3, 3. Um, reverse cascade, so instead of the balls going under, they're kind of going over. This is also 3, 3, 3. So you're, you're missing all these complicated components. Or you could do reverse cascade and you could cross your hands, right? And that's not going to be in the sequence either. Or you could do Mills Mess. This one looks like crazy, but it's. I mean, it's just three throws, but it's a lot harder to describe. You're not getting in the sequence like what your hands are exactly doing. The rule was just that the left has to go to the right, the right has to go to the left if you're throwing threes, right? Um, same thing with fours, like the four, four, four. So again, that fours. So fountain, uh, you could have the throws go from, from in to out like that. You could have them go out to in. You could have them be in columns, like individual columns, right? Right. So they're not even making this circular pattern. But you're still doing throws of four. So it's not going to be perfect every single time. So <laughs> you might ask, well, are there other algebraic gadgets I could use to, to analyze juggling patterns? And so I wanted to show you one of those. And uh, Okay, so we're going to use something called braids, okay? So what is a braid? Okay. So we're going to take, it's probably, you have a picture in your mind of what a braid is, it's probably going to be very close to this. So here's like the formal definition. I'm going to take two parallel planes, okay? And then I'm going to put, let's say, um, I'm going to put N, I'm going to put four dots over here and four dots over there. In general, you just put N dots and N dots on both planes. And then what you're going to do is you're going to just draw some curve from A1 to any of those, those Bs, okay? So I'm going to draw this curve, A1, and it's going to end up at, if you follow that along, it goes to B4 there. You guys see that? But then as I draw these other strands, you have to envision this in three-dimensional space, so the curves are not going to actually intersect, right? They're not going to touch. But when you try to draw that on a plane, you have to somehow, you have to designate that somehow. So you can kind of see, it's hard for me to point at this, but do you guys see the A1, the strand coming out of that? You can kind of see that it's going over the strand coming out of A2, right? And that's kind of how you do that. You have to be a little bit careful. You've got to make sure that the, the, uh, when you're going over or under, it's not happening simultaneously with other strands because then the picture is horrible. But do you guys kind of get the picture? You just have a strand. Yeah. It's actually a bi, if you think of, a, think of this as a function, you do have a bijection, right? It's one-to-one -one and onto function, but you're paying attention to the geometry that's actually happening in between. So you get a lot more information here. And you could then forget about the, the planes, and all you're doing is you're just paying attention to where the start and the end are, okay? So that's the thing, that's what we call a braid, which is pretty similar to any braid that you might have in your mind. Okay. So here's what's kind of interesting. You can make an algebraic uh, uh, gadget with this. Okay, how do you do that? 
So let's say that I have this braid alpha. These are, these are now going to be braids with four strands. Okay? So I have four strands, this alpha, and then another braid, uh, beta. Okay? And uh, the way that this gadget works is you, um, instead of like a addition or multiplication, you have a concatenation. So what you do is you just take the end of braid alpha and you just connect it to the beginning of beta, and then you get that picture right there. You guys kind of see that? It's a little bit compact, but if you, if, you, if, if you pull the ends a little bit, the picture will morph into that. <laughs> okay? So that's kind of interesting. Instead of like addition or, you know, multiplication, you have this uh, operation of concatenation. Okay. Now what would the identity be, right? Normally, if you're dealing with an algebraic system where you have addition, the identity is zero, right? But what the heck is the identity for a braid? Well, it's just the braid that doesn't, doesn't weave, right? It's just like this trivial thing that just goes from the beginning to the end. There's no, there's no uh, weaving, okay? So this would be the identity in what's called our braid group, okay? So that's something else we have. And let's say that I have alpha. Is there an inverse? So if you're thinking about addition, right? The inverse of one is minus one. Because <coughs> one plus minus one will give me zero, which is the identity. So what is what the heck is that here? So if I have this braid alpha, is there another braid that I can concatenate with alpha? And I'm going to call that the inverse. And then I would end up with this identity here. It, well, it would look like this. You guys see the alpha braid, that first <coughs> strand goes over the second one. But then this one, you have the second strand, uh, the second strand goes over the first one. And so if you concatenate these, and then you kind of pull the ends, you guys see that it would simplify into this? So that's how that, that works. It's really hard to, <laughs> to do this stuff until you kind of like draw it out and, and simplify it a little bit, but hopefully that kind of makes sense. So that's, that's our algebraic gadget. Okay, we have this concatenation, we have an identity, we have inverses, and it actually forms what's called a group. Okay? And now we're going to use these braids to encode juggling patterns. So now let me show you first, before I give you some examples of that, why is this better than the sequences? Well, for every braid, this braid alpha, I actually can associate to it a permutation. So if you guys just pay attention to, the, to where the beginning and the, the end is, do you guys see that one goes to two, right? And two goes to one, and three goes to three, and four goes to four, right? So there's a way to kind of write that out, and it looks like this. So this notation just means one goes to two, and then two goes to, well, it reaches that parenthesis, so it goes back to the beginning. So one goes to two, and two goes to one. But look at this. Alpha inverse actually does the same thing. If you're just paying attention to the beginning and the end, you're not paying attention to the geometry, you guys see that one still goes to two, and two still goes to one. So if you, if you look at the sequence associated to this, it's actually the same one. See that? But are those different? I mean, if you handed those to a little kid, they would say they're definitely different, right? Because the top one is weaving differently than the, sec the second one, right? So this is, I'm just showing you that the braid captures more information. You guys kind of see that? So maybe it would capture, it would distinguish more patterns, okay, if we used it. And if you, if you take alpha and you square it, like just do alpha times alpha, you will get this braid. You'll get this little twist. But look at, look at what the sequence is. One goes to one, right? And two goes to two. And three goes to three, and four goes to four. So that actually is doing the same thing that the identity does, but it's different, right? That's not, that is not the identity braid, right? If you try to pull that apart, you're gonna have that twist in there, okay? So I'm just showing you that the braids have more stuff in them, okay? The pictures have more things than just the sequences. Okay, so here is, here is how you make a braid for these juggling patterns. So one way to kind of think about this is if I took these three balls and I attached strings to them and you just juggle them, they would weave out, a, weave out a braid. Okay, so that's one way to think about it. Another way to think about it is if I start from this spot and then I travel, the, the balls are gonna trace out some segment. Right, so you guys kind of see that they're tracing out, like if you kind of had a light on each one, it would trace out this, this arc, okay? And it would look like this. So the cascade, this one would look like this pattern. But the reverse cascade would, this is the reverse cascade. Remember that those were three, 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 three? 
So the sequence didn't distinguish those, but the braids actually do. So this braid is distinct from that braid. Okay. Um, unfortunately, all that complicated structure is still not enough to distinguish all the seat, all the patterns. Because over here, pistons is just this. So, right. But uh, you guys kind of see if there were strings attached to those, they wouldn't. They're not weaving. You guys kind of see that. So that's why the braid is that. The, the trivial breed. And if I do tennis, that one, is, I mean, um, it might seem like they're weaving, but that top one is really, if you think of it as a strand, it's just kind of going back and forth. So you really only have to pay attention to the, the bottom two, and they're not actually weaving. So that one also gives you the trivial breed. And a box, that looks like this. So this one is also not weaving. Um, okay. <laughs> so all I'm showing you here is the braids do distinguish some of them, but it's still not perfect, okay? But what's really neat is that no matter what braid you, you, uh, you hand someone, <clears throat> it turns out you can actually juggle it. So the shower, the 5-1, that, that was this. You can kind of see how that braid is having this sort of global twist to it. You guys kind of see that? <laughs> and the half shower, that does, uh, oh, I have, yeah. The half shower looks like this. It's pretty much doing the same thing as the 5-1. It's just a little bit slower. You see that? It's kind of making like a circular pattern. So those are not distinguished, but it's definitely different from the previous ones. Okay. And here's, a, here's kind of an interesting result. It turns out that every finite braid, if, it, if you hand me a braid on n strands, you can juggle it actually, which is quite interesting. <laughs> right? You don't have some crazy restriction um, just any braid can be juggled. And that's a pretty new result, actually, 2003. Um, okay, yeah. <laughs> Maybe uh, I just wanted to show you this, too. Another property, so here's the cascade braid, okay? If you color the strands, each strand is a ball, right? If you color the strands, you're going to get three different colors. And uh, the cascade has this really interesting property that if you take out any of those braids, if you delete one, so let's say you delete the blue, okay? The result would be this picture right here. And if you pull this, you guys see that you'll get the, you'll get the trivial braid that doesn't have any weaving pattern in it? Yeah. So it has this really neat property. And a braid of that type, it has a special name. This is called a Brunian braid. And um, <laughs> recently, people have been studying this because it has a lot of useful um, connections between other areas of math. But I just wanted to show you this because maybe you've seen something related to this Brunian braid, which is called a Borromean ring. If you actually take the ends of, if you take the ends of the strands and then you connect them back to the beginning again, and you fiddle with this a little bit, you guys see that you're getting, you're getting. Uh, loops, right? You're getting sort of these ring patterns. So if you, if you rearrange it, it would look like that. And that's called a Borromean ring. And a Borromean ring has a similar property that if you were to delete any of the rings, it will, the whole thing will disconnect. So it just has this neat property. Maybe you've seen this before. It's usually used in a lot of like organizations. They like that emblem because it's like if one thing falls apart, then the whole thing doesn't really <coughs> stay together. Um, oh, if you want to see what the five ball cascade looks like, that was kind of a terrible mess. I was, I was just, I just made it because I was kind of interested if it had the same property that the, that the three ball cascade had, where if you deleted a strand, would it trivialize? And it, it doesn't. <laughs> it's way messier. But the three ball cascade somehow is, is nice. Um, I don't know, do I have time to show one more thing? You do. You are <laughs> okay, so here's, here's one more kind of interesting thing. So <coughs> here's, here's a juggling diagram, right? So this is, uh, this is the 5-1 pattern, right? Okay, if you just stop juggling, you guys see that the balls did something, right? So if I just stop some moment in the, in the sequence, okay, then what's happening? Well, the balls are going to land in certain hands, right? And this is what's called like a landing schedule, okay? Those are the scheduled landings for those balls. And what you could do is you could just say, okay, let's, let's make an X wherever the balls are going to land. And then wherever there's nothing, we'll just put spaces. Right? And then let's just pay attention 
to where the first ball lands and the last ball lands. Okay? And so we just get this nice little picture here. Okay? That right there is called the juggling state. So at a moment in time, you could sort of freeze time and you are going to be in some state of the juggling pattern. Okay? And so here's the question. How do I get from one state to another state? Well, I have to throw that ball that landed, right? The first ball. So let's just say that I continue this. I throw a five, then it's gonna come back five beats later, right? And it's gonna introduce this little gap here, this gap, but then it lands. And now I have a new state, right? Now I'm in this state, okay? So what I have is sort of a way to go from one state to another, and I can sort of translate how this is working. So here, here it is again. That was the state we were in. And we got to this state by throwing a ball of height five. You see that? Can I go back? Or can I go to some other state? Well, if I, if I take this current state, do you guys see if I throw this ball now, just a one, it'll get me back to this picture here. You see that? So this is just showing you how you can go from one state to the other. And it's just another way of representing that juggling sequence. So the five, one, five, one, five, one is just going between these two states, right? And uh, the three, 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 that one's a little bit boring. I mean, but you can go from that state to itself by just throwing threes. And you can go from the three, three, the, that state to this one. You guys see if I throw this first ball now, if I throw it four, one, two, gap, and then four, I would get to this state right here. Right? So what you get in the end <coughs> is just this nice graph. Nice. So this, so this graph. <laughs> This graph is just uh, if you are throwing uh, three balls, okay, and you're, you're looking at uh, max height throws of five, it would look like this. If you increase your height throws to whatever you want, you would get this infinite graph, but if you just restrict yourself to height five with three balls, that's what the picture would look like. So what you could do is you could take that and you could study, well, what, how is that useful to a juggler? Right? If you want to go from one state to another one, like I want to go from this to a cascade, you could figure out, okay, well, I just have to do that throw. You see? It's just helping you transition from one pattern to another one. It's kind of solving that problem for you. Because if you look at this, I have, uh, okay, do you guys see down here? We have the five and then the one, five, one, five, one. So let's say you wanted to go from five, one to, I don't know, uh, uh, where's the three, three, three? Oh, right here. You guys see this is three, 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 three. So if you're doing five, one, five, one, five, one, you could just throw a two real quick, and then you can get to three, 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 three. So let's see if that works. So here's five, one, and uh, okay. Well, I don't think I really did that right. <laughs> but you guys kind of see how um, if you if you're doing some juggling pattern, you could transition to the other one. You could figure out what those intermediate throws have to actually be. All right, I just wanted to show you that because maybe you kind of find graphs more interesting than uh, algebra. And so you could do all sorts of stuff with this. Um, you could do, you could go back and you could, you could relax that third rule. You could allow multiple throws. That's called multiplex juggling. So like you could do, you could do stuff like this where you're throwing multiple balls, right? Uh, but that wasn't allowed before. And then you could do all, everything all over again. You could ask like how many ways could you do that and all sorts of other stuff. Or you could do sync, you, could, you know how you're not allowed, you have to do left, right, left, right? You could do synchronized throws too. Like this is, this is both throwing both hands at the same time. Another example that would be this, where you're throwing, you're, 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 you gotta throw them at the same time, okay? Not uh, alternating. All right, I just thought maybe you'd find that last bit interesting if you like graphs. Um, so thank you, and... Uh, <laughs> Here's a couple of books you might find interesting. This one really dives into the math a little bit more, but the mathematical, uh, <coughs> mathematical mathematics has a lot more, uh, it has some juggling and then it also has uh, like card, card tricks that have a lot of math behind them. You might find that interesting too. Sorry I went over. <laughs> oh, you're fine. Okay, thank you, Nate, so yeah. much. Appreciate it. Just a little aside. Um, when Nate and I were in school together here, you were on the juggling club, right? <laughs> yeah. RIT has a juggling club, and they're actually really fantastic.